And we need to realize that as far as the canon of Scripture is concerned, God didn't speak with a voice from heaven and say, you have to have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. We're going to speak today about the Apostle Philip. You don't hear too many sermons about him. So I hope your curiosity is piqued because you're going to hear something that you never dreamt you would ever hear. And I never dreamt I would ever preach it. I have been doing a lot of research. There is a legend about the Apostle Philip, how that he was tortured and crucified upside down. And they were about to crucify Bartholomew or Nathaniel, who was with him. And Philip begged them to release him, which they did. That's a legend. Because we come from the Western churches and have nothing to do with Orthodox churches, we know little of the legends that have accrued in their history and in the history indeed also of the Western Roman Catholic Church. And being Protestant, we tend to ignore everything that ever went on in those churches, which is a, a huge mistake. It is uh, pride, I think, to have the such an estimation of our own Christianity that we fail to see the glory of Christ working in all the centuries in some way or other, somewhere in the world, in some churches, in some places. Even as today we see his glory being manifest in different churches in different ways and even in churches that we would deem to be backslidden and cold and they are probably but nevertheless there's a, a little flicker there's a flame all the, all the way through the church of Jesus Christ there has been that flame so we do ourselves an injustice to ignore the findings of scholars and to throw aside scholarship. The charismatics that I have heard and seen tend to do this to a large degree. They call seminaries cemeteries. Well, maybe they are. But so is many a Bible school and so is many a church that is supposed to be having lots of... Uh, clapping and happy clappy how much truth of the word of God is in them not much as I have seen in many a place so it is better to look at what we can see that comes to us from the throne of God in history in scholarship without which we would never be where we are today and in history historical accounts and so forth. Well, in dealing with the Apostle Philip, we're going to look at what the scriptures say about him, and there are something to Philip's mentioned. And we're going to look into the fact that Philip was with Jesus for three years. That would have made it from found impression on anything he did the rest of his life. And I'm also have taking the liberty of introducing you to some of the miracles that were commonplace in our ministry of how many years in Indonesia? Well, on and off there would have been at least eight. And how many years in Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Philippines, Philippines. Then of later years in India, Sri Lanka and Pakistan and even in our own country of Australia. We have seen the miracle working power of God continuously throughout our ministry in some form or other. 
Of course, it didn't develop into a large scale till we went overseas to the few countries we went to. I think there were eight that I did count that were heathen countries. We always saw miracles. Always. I'm not saying we saw them every minute of the day. I remember when we were pastoring our first church in a little town called Gamary and somebody got saved. Oh, I was so thrilled. I thought I would love to see this every day. Well, we didn't see it every day. But I have seen much every day in different parts of the world where I've been that a far eclipsed the salvation of one soul. We've seen many multitudes filled with the miracle of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Multitudes. Healings. Cancers. The dead raised. Demon power. And so I'm going to take the liberty of introducing little things like that so that we can begin to realize the kind of church that Jesus Christ instituted and inaugurated that was never a denomination. It was never an organization. It was a church led by the Holy Ghost and by the word of the Lord through apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers and pastors. Pastor teachers. So we're going to go through the those kind of things and I hope you will bear with me and not turn off because you're going to hear something that you won't hear in ordinary churches that I have never heard myself and have never preached. Most churches wouldn't accept what I want to say. I doubt if there would be one church that would anywhere. Most would not accept the miracles. Somebody turned to one of my sermons that we had had in India in, of late years where there was a mighty, the beginning of a mighty move of God in a church and the people and the children were filled with the Holy Ghost. Some Christian kept on writing to me and saying they're mad. Well, they thought, they thought Paul was mad good company. We have to be very careful that we don't ascribe the works of the Holy Ghost to Satan. It's virgining, verging on blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. And Jesus said that blasphemy against the Holy Ghost is a, a sin that will not be forgiven. We tend to treat that lightly. I have heard sermons uh, from Americans, basically, didn't seem to happen in Australia, where somebody refuted what God was doing. They turned it down and either went outside the church and were killed or the next day something like that happened to them. So we do have to be very careful that we don't say of the works of the Holy Ghost that it is of the devil. Now that does not mean to say that we have to lo you, uh, lose our discretion and our wisdom and our judgment. We have to judge. The Apostle Paul said, let there be gifts of the Holy Ghost in 1 Corinthians 14. Prophecy. Let the others judge. And uh, in Thessalonians, I think it's 1 Thessalonians 5, he says, do not forbid prophecy. But it has to be done with the judgment of others to make sure it's real prophecy and somebody is not being carried away by their emotions and even by demons. We have noticed of late that in God's working throughout the whole of the Bible there's the good and the evil side by side among the people of God. Evil's in the world all the time. Good intrudes. 
good is in the kingdom of God all the time and evil intrudes. That is there. And I would like to mention this before we get in, in, into the Bible itself, that in relation to this book that is fairly new to me, the Acts of Philip, that is not part of the canon of Scripture. But the amazing thing about it is, it was in a few languages, not just Greek. It's been discovered in, in a few languages, like, uh, the, I have them somewhere, for instance, like Arabic and Ethiopic and Coptic, to start off with, and Armenian and Georgian. Here it is in front of my eyes. There are manuscripts from the Coptic, which is the Egyptian, into Arabic, Ethiopic, Armenian, and Georgian texts. And of course, there was the original Greek that maybe it was written in. I don't think it was written in Hebrew. So we have something solid to stand upon and when we hear different things from this book, which we will do over the course of time, we will be able to judge it in relation to what the Word of God that we have does say. Is it scriptural? If it's not, disregard it. If it's according to scripture, we better look at it. And we need to realize that as far as the canon of Scripture is concerned, God didn't speak with a voice from heaven and say, you have to have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. You have to have Matthew, Mar Ma uh, Matthew Mark, Luke, and John. No. They were the, the decision of leaders of the church. And if I'm not mistaken, very late. And indeed, as far as the King James Version is concerned, for the first couple of hundred years, and maybe 250 years, it included the Apocrypha, or parts of the Apocrypha. Nearly all of the Apocrypha are of the Roman Catholic Church. And there are two people sitting here today who have seen an 18th century, wasn't it? 18th century version of the King James Version owned by one of their relatives in Sydney, and they saw it and it included the Apocrypha. So what I'm telling you is the truth. So did God say in 1611, in a loud voice, to those who translated it and then published it, you must include the Apocrypha? Because if he did, somebody was disobedient and took it out. So much for the perfection of the King James Version that people worship. There's no perfection about it at all. King James Version, I might say, is the version I grew up on. I started reading it seriously age eight. And I kept on reading it seriously for decades. And what is in my memory is the King James Version. So I thank God for the King James Version. I grew up on it. But there are other versions today that are better. But getting back to the, this book of Philip, it is somewhat different. But as I read through it and have been blessed, I was blessed. I realized Philip had walked with Jesus for three years, and here he is going out of ministry, walking with Jesus in the Holy Ghost. For three years he saw miracles. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you were with a preacher for three years, and all those years you heard wonderful words of truth and saw the miracles every day, unusual happenings? Like somebody walks on the water, Peter. Jesus walks on the water. The temptation of Satan to Jesus. 
that nobody saw, but that is described in the Gospels. Now, where did they get that from? How did they know what happened to Jesus? He was there by himself when the devil took him to three different places. Now, was Jesus transported physically? I don't know. It doesn't say. Was it in vision? I don't know. It doesn't say. How did Matthew know what happened? And the other writers, how did they know what happened? Did Jesus tell them? We don't know. Or did the Holy Ghost just ride through them? We don't know. But there it is, recorded, and we have accepted it all of our lives as being something that happened to Jesus. But how peculiar when you think of it. The devil takes Jesus up to a higher mountain. Jesus is the Son of God, but he's also Son of Man. He's a human being. He's ministering as a human being. He's living as a human being. As a human being, the devil takes Jesus up to a high mountain, it says. Shows him the kingdoms of this world. Tells him to, uh, to jump off something. Tells him to eat stones or something. Anything. Peculiar. Yet it's so familiar because we've read it and heard it we don't think it's strange. Anything that is unfamiliar can be strange. But when I read through the Acts of Philips, I could see great similarities as to what had happened to us in our trips to eight mission fields. Now I say similarities because what happened to Philip far exceeded anything that happened to us and is somewhat more ap apocalyptic. We, we didn't experience anything ap ap apocalyptic, but we saw, not with our eyes, but we saw the devils at work, the demons, their effects. We saw the dead raised, the sick healed, all kinds of things. So, as I read through this book of Acts of Philip, I thought, yes, we experienced a lot of that. You see, the ordinary missionary doesn't experience it. Now, many have. We're not the only ones. I would say there are many missionaries who have experienced far more than what we did, with greater results than whatever we did. But I cannot belittle what we saw God doing. And I cannot denounce and deny and all these supernatural things that happened in our ministry all the time. Our ministry was supernatural in effect. I hasten to add in effect because I can't say we had such marvelous ministry that it was just supernatural all the way. I'm sure we preach them wrong things sometimes. Did some wrong things sometimes. You know, silly little things maybe. Got the wrong opinion sometimes. But we did not, we did not ever experience something from God that we would have to say, that's, that's not God. We knew it was God. It was happening all the time. And so with that, we will now turn to the, to the Gospels to start out and look and see who Philip was. What kind of a person was Philip? And for that we go to John chapter 1. And we see how that Jesus is calling his disciples. In the first chapter, in verse 35, he's, he calls to. 
And uh, there were two who heard John speaking. And they followed Jesus. When John said, Behold the Lamb of God! And these two disciples of John's, when John said that, the scripture says they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following. And they said, what are you, what are you looking for? Not who. And they just said to him, teacher, where are you staying? He said, come and see. And they saw where he was staying and remained with him that day till four o'clock. And one of the two who followed him was Andrew. He first found his brother Simon and he brought Simon to Jesus. It's the next day we're concerned with in verse 43. He decided to go to Galilee. It just says he found Philip. You know, he knew where Philip was. He had decided to call Philip. After all, he is God. And he also was in touch with his father. Jesus found Philip. You know, he always comes seeking. He went looking for the one who had been elected to be one of the disciples, Philip. He came seeking for you and me. And he found us. We didn't find him, he found us. Then we found him. And our Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. So what is the first thing Philip does? He goes and finds Nathaniel or Bartholomew. Those are his names. And said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. He didn't say son of Mary. Son of Joseph. And of course, he was speaking, knowing that he was born of Mary, but knowing, one, that he had to have an adoptive father, and two, knowing that he came from Nazareth. He was a Nazarene. So Nathaniel asked the question, can anything good come out of, out of Nazareth? So what does Philip say? Come and see. See, Philip is so convinced that this is the, the Christ. So that's the kind of person Philip was there. The first thing he does is find somebody else. Now, the same situation was with Andrew. But you don't hear anything more about Andrew in the whole of the New Testament. And as far as I know, there's nothing written about Andrew by anyone else, unless I've missed it. The first thing Andrew does is to find his own brother. But Philip finds somebody who is not his brother. He's more evangelistic. He's looked already the beginnings of a ministry are starting in his life the minute he is found by Jesus. 